Uh, notable events of my youth included the uh, collapse of the Berlin Wall, um, the uh, ultimate breakup of the Soviet Union, which after which Ukraine declared its independence in 1991, and in 1994, when uh, Oksana Bayul won the first ever uh, gold medal for, uh, for Ukraine in any Olympic sport, winning the uh, figure skating gold medal in 1994 Winter Olympics. The Orange Revolution actually reinvigorated my uh, passion for Ukraine in 2004. This took place after an extremely corrupt presidential election process that um, was eventually overturned uh, by the help of people in the West. Uh, Viktor Yushchenko was ultimately the rightful winner, uh, replacing the corrupted winner of Viktor Yanukovych. Russia, in its unfortunate cynical style, uh, chose to deal with this issue by poisoning uh, President uh, Viktor Yushchenko. Many think it actually took place when he was visiting actually New York City with dioxin. Uh, dioxin is actually, for those of you who may or may not know, is actually Agent Orange. So we kind of know what the, what the message was received loud and clear there. Uh, unfortunately, seven years later in 2010, um, Viktor Yanukovych, who actually had been, uh, who had won the 2004 election fraudulently, actually won it legitimately, uh, thus setting Ukraine on its path uh, back towards uh, realigning itself with Russia, which is clearly what not the people wanted. Uh, a couple years went by, uh, Ukraine had, uh, had, had planned on aligning with the European Union, and uh, he did a last minute U-turn in 2013. Some of you may have heard about this. It started the uh, Euromaidan movement, uh, which ultimately led to tens of thousands of people going to the streets in uh, downtown Kiev. Uh, ultimately, started on Facebook, ironically. Uh, this would eventually become the Ukrainian revolution of dignity. As I was watching this from afar, I was flabbergasted by the lack of uh, American media coverage of this event. So I joined Twitter in 2014, in January. I watched in real time as the citizens uh, were attacked by the police. These poor folks were picking up cobblestones on the street to fight back. Fighting back with wooden shields, uh, firing Molotov cocktails at military units as they charged them, uh, burning tires, to building barricades to try and protect themselves from the constant attacks from, the, uh, from their own government. Ultimately, later on in the month in January, uh, there was a, a law passed that actually pr prohibited all forms of protest. This only furthered the resolve of the Ukrainian people. So at this particular time, I started to spend an awful lot more time on, uh, online. I'm going to tell you about my friend Bob, uh, Bob from Crimea, I'll call him. I won't tell you his last name. After you hear the story, you'll know why. Bob was a British man who had moved to Crimea, fell in love with a local Ukrainian woman who would eventually he would, uh, he would marry. One time I was talking with him on Facebook right after this, uh, this event had happened, and uh, Bob said, hold on, I have a knock at the door. He went to the door and he was greeted by a soldier who was, spoke Russian, uh, dressed in full military garb, did not have the Russian patch, but was clearly a Russian soldier. This person asked Bob to produce his British passport. When Bob gave him his passport, the soldier took a cigarette lighter out and lit it on fire and said, now you're not going anywhere, buddy. Of course, he said that in Russian. I don't speak very good Russian, so that's, but that's what he said. Bob came back and told me, that that had happened, and I knew for, for real that this was actually a much, much more serious situation than even I had realized. Soon after, little green men started showing up in, uh, in uh, Crimea at the uh, military base called Belbek. The uh, Ukrainian soldiers there were told to lay down their arms, which they did because their leadership told them to do so. And uh, the next night, these leaders fled to Moscow and basically, you know, turn coated on the Ukrainian nation for cash. Uh, this would ultimately lead to more protest in Kiev, ultimately at its, at its peak, 500,000 people. And uh, Viktor Yanukovych cracked down further on these poor folks, thus leading to a couple-day event in mid-February 2014, where I watched, along with millions of other people around the world, as uh, these poor people were literally shot to death from snipers on buildings. 100 people were killed. Actually, we think it's more than that, but there's, there's still people that just disappeared. These people are referred to the Heavenly Hundred. The uh, President Viktor Yanukovych, after this horrible event, fled in the middle of the night on a helicopter to Moscow, where he remains to this day wanted for war crimes against humanity. Shortly after this event happened, uh, an illegal referendum in Crimea was held, 
where uh, at gunpoint, where the winning candidates, sorry, winning candidates, so to speak, re had received 4% of the vote only four years earlier. Soon after, uh, Russian troops showed up in Donetsk, in uh, Luhansk, and uh, was under the pretense of protecting Russian-speaking citizens, which uh, incidentally was the same excuse that Adolf Hitler used to attack uh, Czechoslovakia and Austria prior to uh, World War II starting back in the 19, late 1930s. By the way, Russian-speaking Ukrainians and, and uh, Ukrainian-speaking Ukrainians had gotten along just fine prior to these little green men showing up. So this Russian invasion of Europe, because after all, Ukraine is a European country, a lot of people don't know that, uh, has resulted uh, in the last four years is an undeclared war, uh, 10,000 deaths, over twice as many casualties, over 1.6 million refugees that nobody here in the world really talks about. Uh, this, was, this attack was a direct violation of the Budapest Memorandum. Uh, this was a memorandum that was reached between the United States, uh, actually between the United States, Russia, England, other countries, and Ukraine, because after the breakup of the Soviet Union in, uh, in the uh, early 90s, a lot of people don't know, but Ukraine had the third largest uh, arsenal of nuclear weapons in the world. The world wasn't really too comfortable with that, so they agreed, uh, to, Ukraine voluntarily agreed to give these weapons up in exchange for future protection against attacks. We all know how that went, and uh, when, the, when Russia invaded, the world basically sat by and, and, and did nothing. Uh, it's not a, no accident that countries like Iran and North Korea have been ratcheting up their attempts ever since the last few years to try and develop nuclear weapons because the West war doesn't really mean, uh, mean the uh, paper that it's printed on. So after watching all these events, I was extremely moved, to say the least, and I knew I needed to join the fight, but how could I do that? So I started a Facebook group. I called it one million people around the world in support of Ukraine's fight for freedom. I knew I had str struck on a very good theme because we grew to 1,500 people within 24 hours uh, from countries all over the world. This group inspired me to travel to Ukraine for the first time in my life, uh, two, a couple weeks after the, uh, the horrible killings. I was able to speak at a prayer service in Lviv, which is the western part of the country, uh, honoring 17 of the 100 people who had been brutally murdered by the government. Uh, as it turns out, this was actually carried on national television. Did not know that at the time. It was only a 90 second speech. After I gave the speech, I was incredibly moved almost to tears as I walked up the stage there was literally a line of people around the block waiting to shake my hand with their hands bowed across their heart. They were just so moved that somebody from the United States was there telling them that there were other people around the world who actually cared about what was going on to the people. At that point, it really justified why I had flown to Ukraine. People were not just fighting for their economic freedom, but literally for the fighting for their very lives and right to exist. All these people wanted to join the EU was to have a similar lifestyle to their neighbors to the West, Poland, who 10 years earlier had joined the EU, and uh, you know, 10 years later had about three to four times the average quality of life and monthly income as the Ukrainian neighbors to the, to, the, uh, to the East. So after I was in Lviv, I had the opportunity to travel to Kiev, where I was given a private tour of the self-defense uh, forces that were set up in tents all around the city. Following day, I actually was able to go on a stage, not dissimilar to this, except instead of there being a couple hundred people you out there, there's about five or 6,000 people out there. And uh, I was given an opportunity to speak, but because my Ukrainian is nowhere near as good as my English, quite frankly, I chickened out. <laughs> the incredible thing was I actually got a standing ovation and I didn't say a word. Um, even thinking about it to this day gets me very emotional. Uh, later on that evening, we had stayed at the Hotel Ukraine, uh, which was right across the square, and uh, only two weeks earlier, I'd actually seen uh, 12 people literally bleed to death in the hotel lobby downstairs. Quite an incredible time. So after this, I returned to the United States, started working more actively, and, and led a march in February 2015 in Washington, D.C., where we had reached out to the Baltic community, specifically had the president of the Lithuanian American community join us on our march. What this demonstrated was that we were going to be quite more than just a Facebook group. Because of my, I guess, persistence, uh, ability to attract people, we had over 40,000 people in the group at this point. I had reached out to uh, Fox News. I don't have any training as a journalist or as a writer, 
but I was able to convince them to write an op-ed, or let me publish an op-ed piece about what I was doing with the group and also the march, actually in advance of it, to try and get more media coverage to come out. We published the piece. Uh, I met another gentleman by the name of Andy Billick, who's since become a good friend. He's a retired journalist. He was instrumental in the 80s, actually leading tens of thousands of Ukrainians in the streets in Washington, D.C. He helped me tremendously to write a second op-ed piece that was targeted toward the African-American community, detailing the historic friendship between one of the most famous Ukrainians of all time, Taras Shevchenko, a famous poet, and Ira Aldridge and their, their tremendous friendship that they had in the 1860s, which was actually a time when uh, slavery still existed in the United States. So, after this, I actually prepared to go back to Ukraine for a second time for almost a year, except this time my, per my trip had two purposes. In the prior year, I had actually hosted, along with my wife, a Ukrainian orphan from Odessa, and after a series of back and forth, she had asked my wife and I, not only could we adopt her, but could we also adopt her best friend? Now this was a big decision as we had three children of our own, two of which are in the audience right there tonight. And uh, my wife said yes, God bless her. I traveled back to Ukraine to this internet, which is what they call orphanages in Ukraine. I'll never forget that. Uh, there was a road that you don't drive on when it rains. We traveled through a village that had bombed out houses from World War II that still had not been fixed. No electricity, no heat. Orphanage that they were in didn't have drinking water. There was 92 kids there. There was no toilets. There was literally just two holes in the ground for them to, for them to use. I had asked some of the locals, you know, why do you guys not have any signs? Never forget the answer. Well, we took them down so that the Germans didn't know where to drive their tanks. I said, guy, I said, that was like 70 years ago. Obviously, this place didn't have a lot of tourists, to say the least. Unbelievable. So while I was there, because the adoption process took 68 days consecutively, I was able to travel around the country uh, because of my contacts in the group going all the way from the extreme northeastern part in Kharkiv, uh, where I was able to give a press conference, uh, where they actually put out uh, a video of the march that we had done in Washington, D.C. only months earlier. Kharkiv, so you don't, any of you might know, is actually the second largest city in Ukraine with over a million people uh, behind Kiev. And then we were also able to travel across to the western part of the country, back to Lviv, back to the place where my ancestors are from, and I was interviewed by a television station Zeke, again, telling them what I was doing, what I was all about, and what we were trying to accomplish with the group. So recent initiatives include last year in May, uh, we did another march from the uh, Washington Memorial, I'm sorry, the Washington Monument to the uh, Halitamore Memorial, and that march has attracted over 400,000 views so far to date online. We had reached out to the producer and the director of a Ukrainian documentary called Breaking Point, the War for Democr Democracy in Ukraine. Uh, Mark Jonathan Harris, he's the producer. He actually has won three Academy Awards for Best Documentary over three different decades. Uh, his writer, Paul Wolanski, I was able to convince these guys to actually fly from Southern California, from Hollywood to DC, and we were able to, with my help and their help, screen this documentary inside the US Capitol to congressmen and women and former and current ambassadors uh, from and to Ukraine. Unbelievable experience. These gentlemen also marched with us the next day. We've become good friends ever since. This march was done to highlight the, uh, the importance of the relatively unknown uh, mass genocide and starvation of Ukrainians that took place from 1932 to 1933, where seven to 10 million Ukrainians were starved to death by uh, Joseph Stalin. That's a relatively unknown uh, tragedy in human history, so much so that you know, when I had reached out to the National Park Service, whose very job is to actually maintain this, this monument and this memorial, the people who were at the Park Service didn't even know about this memorial in their own town in Washington, D.C. So that kind of further proves uh, why, why I do what I do. We had reached out in this march to members from the African American, Latino, Asian, and LGBT community, and we had representatives from all four communities join us at the march. Uh, we think that this was the first time that ever happened in the Ukrainian diaspora in the United States. Current initiatives, we are in the process of forming uh, an NGO called Millions of Voices for Ukraine, the goal being to activate both Ukrainians and non-Ukrainians alike, uh, to give them a voice, 
because the Russian propaganda machine is very well funded. And right now the feeling is that it's a debate where only one side is really showing up. So we know how that goes. We really feel that the world needs to know, you know how important the situation in Ukraine is, the truth about what's really going on, and why it's relevant to each and every one of us, uh, not just for Ukrainians' sake, but Americans and Europeans. So the Ukrainian people have been fighting this war for four years by themselves. And it's very important that they know and that we know that it's, they're not just fighting for themselves, but they're really fighting for all of us. You folks here tonight who, uh, who go to JMU, you know, you're, you're representative of the next generation of Americans. This is a new time with social media not only helping to elect a recent American president, but also a current American president who actually uses Twitter to actually set public policy. We need to exercise our voices and use these new tools that we have to reach out to each other in a civil and humane way. You know, lessons that I've learned since I've become a, a volunteer and an activist the last four years, one of the things that uh, I really believe in strongly is being polite and kind to everybody, whether they have, share the same point of view or, as not, or pardon me, as you or not. Example of that, you know, when I, I've led so many of these demonstrations now, I, I can't even keep count. Every time I do so, a lot, I always try and reach out. There's always police there because they always assume that these people are coming out to cause trouble. Not the case with us, but not always the case, unfortunately. I always go out of my way to reach out to the highest commanding officer on site and go out and, and shake his hand. Why do I do this? Well, I think it sets the tone, and I can tell you, I can't even tell you the look on their faces, how they smile, and I can tell you personally, they've told me how, how much they really appreciate the gesture. So we really have an opportunity to change the world if we have the courage to reach out, not just to people who agree with us, but for people who don't know what the heck we're talking about, or even those who have a different point of view. Remember, you can't have a handshake if you reach out if the other person doesn't reach back. An echo chamber, although it might be helpful for my speech preparation tonight, and for all of us who are fortunate enough to speak, it's not really helpful in the real world and how it works. Example of what I'm talking about is the recent gun control situation, which has gotten out of control in a raging situation. You know, we all know what happened in Parkland, Florida last month. I've heard people say such things as the NRA organization are a bunch of terrorists. I've heard people on the other side say they're trying to take all our guns away. If you really step back and think about it, if you're trying to affect change, alienating the other side is not going to do anything. It's just going to get people to retreat to the respective political corners and, and if anything, retrench even further. Not going to do anything. So we need to have civil discourse. I mean, this, this is a, a founding bedrock principle of America. Uh, I, fear, I fear that it's being eroded by apathy, vitriol, name calling, and in corresponding lack of outreach or action. You know, clicking like, clicking share is great, but we need to do things in the real world. And if I could give you folks any advice, trust your inner voice, because it speaks the truth. Don't care or concern yourself with what the rest of the world thinks. If somebody else disagrees with your point of view, you might have wisdom that they might not have. Or they might have wisdom that you don't possess either. It's very good, very good words to live by. So what I'll close them by saying in Ukrainian, thank you. May God bless you all, and Slava Ukraine. Thank you.